The election took place shortly after, in late May, and was carefully watched by both parties. Tens of thousands of workers were compelled to vote, and the results were tallied up. To give an idea of the feeling of this, there was one anonymous worker who wrote in Jesus Christ on his ballot, and the pro-Ford counters successfully argued that by writing Jesus Christ, the worker was referring to Henry Ford, and thus the vote should be counted as no union. The options given to the workers were CIO, AFL, or no union. Only 3% of the 83,000 voters chose no union, and 70% of the voters chose CIO. This meant that the CIO organization now officially represented all workers of the Verge River plant. All employees there were members of the union, and the union membership fees were automatically taken from each of their paychecks. In return, the union now had a much stronger foothold from which they could have a go at the many built-up grievances. Employees previously fired for suspected union activities were now allowed to sue the Ford company for wage disputes as well, and they were later allowed to be rehired at the Ford plant. This did not, however, stop him from suing the strike organizers for damages made to his shop and equipment. The union, in turn, forced Ford to increase worker wages, which had failed to increase along with the other companies in the industry and were no longer the best. The conflict between Bennett and the union, although greatly shifted in favor of the union, was not ended. Bennett would try, mostly unsuccessfully, to plant his own loyal employees into elections for department-level union leadership. He also granted special favors to low-level union leaders trying to gain their favor. The union was still very much in control, until Pearl Harbor and the start of World War II, during which all unions in defense manufacturing industries promised no strikes until the war is won, which Bennett took full advantage of, doing things that the union would strike over in a heartbeat at any other time. The passive aggressions between the union and the Ford Company would get so bad, in fact, that the union requested an impartial judge to be appointed to help solve labor disputes. Ford agreed to have a judge, but then spent five months arguing with the union over who the judge would be. To the press, Ford was always careful to appear on good terms with the union, because his government contracts depended on it. Despite this, one union representative during the war years would remark that it was harder to arrange a meeting with Ford than with the President of the United States. 1938 was a big year in Henry Ford's personal life. It was the year of his 50th wedding anniversary, and of his 75th birthday. For the former event, the man's love and passion for his wife had not diminished throughout the years. When asked years later about the greatest event in his life, he would reply, Why, it was meeting and marrying Mrs. Ford. If anyone thinks I've done anything in my life, they should remember that my wife has been a great helper. I don't believe I would have got far without her. She's always believed in me and backed me in whatever I've attempted. I've always called her the Great Believer. For the latter event, his birthday, Ford was presented with honors from several different countries in recognition of his trailblazing in industrial production and in auto mechanics. He was the first non-British native to earn a James Watt medal from said land's government, a land where many of his factories were turning out cars. Russia also honored him. Ford had a long-standing friendship with Soviet industrialists, having sent engineers to Russia and received some of the Soviet engineers for training in production line techniques as far back as 1929. The revolution in manufacturing in the Soviet Union after that greatly increased the Soviets' ability to hold the line against the Russians in the eastern front of the war. As a result of a funny twist of fate, some of these Soviet engineers happened to be at the Ford plant during the infamous Hunger March, and rumor has it they were laughing and joking about how silly the American quote-unquote communists were acting. He also earned an Iron Cross award from Hitler's Weimar Germany, something which prompted many rabid, though not wholly misplaced, accusations of racism to be hurled. Ford did many dealings with the British. In fact, his Brit and Canadian factories were turning out war materials in the late 30s and early 40s, even as his American factories were participating in Lend-Lease. The most notable of these was his Windsor factory, which produced tanks throughout the war at peak production speed and efficiency. Ford also took great interest in farming during this time. In Britain, there's a story of him having dinner at an event attended by several lords, he got into a conversation with one of them and asked why the island was having such trouble producing food. The Lord replied that they simply couldn't. The story goes that Ford replied, Nonsense, let me show you. Within a year, Ford had bought a plot of land in England, and within another year, it had begun making a sizable profit selling vegetables. A quote from Ford, There's not a country in the world that might not support itself if it knew how to use the soil. He believed that lack of knowledge of efficient farming methods and the resulting scarcity of resources is one of the things that fueled the early years of the Second World War in Europe. My opinion, he wasn't too far off. He also kept focus on the gradually improving process of making plastic from soybeans grown in South America. This came at a good time because the plastic was a nice replacement for many car parts made of metal, 
which had been rationed due to the war. In some cases, the plastic was found to be even better than the metal because, in case of an accident, the plastic was capable of bending and bouncing back like a rubber ball. He said of the plastics research facility, I wouldn't be surprised if this library comes to be the most important building in our plant. He of course owned the farms in South America as well, because he didn't want to be caught not in control of any one level of production. Another Ford project at the time, another having to do with farming, consisted of adopting and reforming wards of the state. He bought a plot of land and built a sleeping quarters in 1938 that could house 62 older teenage boys. They were then allowed, with the help of advisors who knew what needed to be done and how, to delegate tasks amongst themselves and start an efficient farming business. The plan worked wonderfully. The boys turned a great profit, much of the money from which they were allowed to keep, and after their time farming, Ford offered to instantly hire each of them in his factory. Not a bad start to their adult lives. He said of them, the boys are like most Americans. Give them a chance and they'll help themselves. The Ford company had a knack for training young adults. In fact, shortly after Pearl Harbor, the U.S. Navy contracted the Henry Ford Trade School to train their recruits in mechanical skills. The Ford Company obliged with plans to eagerly hire the surplus of skilled veterans after the war was over. Ford's attitude to the war at the beginning was much like that of the First World War, though less optimistic and more weary. He is said to have wished the two warring sides would destroy each other. When Pearl Harbor happened, again much like the First World War, he turned his mind in, in favor of America throwing the last bunch and not the first. By the end of it all, his feelings had slightly shifted to something which can be demonstrated by the quote, It seems that wars are necessary to teach us lessons we seem unable to learn any other way. Following Pearl Harbor, Ford immediately took a huge contract of 4,200 airplanes for the U.S. government. The amount of planes for that contract later increased to 9,000. The Willow Run factory was completed in 1942 and was over a mile long. It started producing planes immediately after construction. What the government had in mind was for the Ford Company to produce one bomber a day for the war effort. Ford had a different plan, to outdo expectations as usual and produce one bomber an hour. This goal, however, was not met until over two years later in 1944, because of various hang-ups at the Willow Run plant. For one, the company, used to making cars and not planes, began using expensive metal dies to cast their parts. The thing they weren't as prepared for was the frequent tweaks in the vehicle design which meant they needed to get new dies every time the War Department came up with a new and improved plan for how to build the planes. For another, it was nothing short of a miracle that mass striking didn't occur at Willow Run. This is because of the lack of housing and the extreme inconvenience of transportation for workers. The lack of housing stemmed from an agreement between Ford and the city of Dearborn that they didn't want a flood of Democrat voters registering addresses in the reliably Republican district. While plans for new suburbs were considered, it never happened, and the employees would either have to carpool nearly an hour each way to and from Detroit every day, or set up camp in the now-growing trailer park sitting in a field near the factory. A lot of workers who got hired from out of state brought their families up, saw the park with its lack of running water or heat, and how inconvenient it would be for police or a fire company to attend it in case of emergency, and turned right back around to head home. Ford work wasn't worth it. About half the workers that did stay quit before their first month was complete. The low worker satisfaction, high turnover rate, passive-aggressive battle with the unions, and high frequency of, work of workers just not showing up for work. Willow Run, dubbed Will It Run by Ford critics, had a messy and unproductive time. The messiness wasn't just on the worker level either. On the executive level, there was a circus of high turnover rates for Willow Run executives, both for medical reasons and for union reasons. One of the few that stayed working at Willow Run a significant amount of time was Ford's own son, Edsel. Edsel cared about Willow Run, and he worked hard to try and improve the production there. Unfortunately, in spring of 1943, he got sick, but he didn't take a vacation from working at Ford. In May of that year, perhaps due to being overworked while ill, he died due to intestinal failure. The trailer park would last throughout most of the year. In 1942, Ford sold a large area of land to the federal government for the purpose of emergency war housing. This housing would not be completed until later, and by the time the building was done, there were more homes than were needed, because Ford had overestimated the amount of employees needed to run the factory. Edsel's death was a significant blow to Ford's personal life, and to the company. Edsel and the company was seen as one of the few friends that the union had in the Ford higher-ups. Following his death, Henry, with a nod of silent consent, watched as Bennett purged the company of many of the officers that Edsel was protecting, most of whom were sympathetic to the Union. Most people, both outsiders and company employees, saw this as a big step backward for the Ford Company's social policy. 
Because of Henry's age, some speculated correctly that this would be Bennett's last big hurrah. Edsel's death left the Ford Company without an heir. Henry, choosing his next of kin, had his grandson, Henry Ford II, pulled out of the Navy to serve the company's executive board, along with Edsel's widow.